Hello there. Nate Boyer is a Texas Longhorn, former active duty Green Beret, former NFL player with the Seattle Seahawks, world traveler, philanthropist, community leader, and now a filmmaker. His new film that he co-wrote, directed, and starred in is called MVP, and it's available now on demand. Nate, thank you so much for the time. How you doing today? I'm good, Trey. Thanks for having me, brother. It is my pleasure, and uh, I got to tell you, man, you were nice enough to send me a link to uh, to watch this movie before uh, you and I had a chance to chat, and I am just blown away by what the end result was. And for people who are maybe vaguely familiar with what you've got going on or maybe unfamiliar uh, totally, this is a movie that you not only starred in, but you also co-wrote and you directed it as well. And the end result is so good. It's certainly not that of uh, somebody who's – uh, really their first time doing all those different things. So for you, what was the starting point for this process and putting this movie together? Well, I appreciate you saying that. And I, I definitely want to say first and foremost, and I'm not just saying this like it's a press conference, you know, but it really was a, a huge team effort. Uh, I had some incredible support on this thing from the beginning, from the inception of the idea through writing it, you know, which I, I co-wrote it uh, with another veteran. Um, he actually told me this is he's the one who came up with the idea of like, hey, we should do this. We should do a movie about the how MVP started um, to the cast and crew. Every veteran prepared on screen is played by a vet. Most of the crew uh, were veterans and these athletes are playing themselves, you know, so it's like a very authentic look at merging vets and players, our organization, um, and kind of a lot of our experiences. Uh, but also like it was made by us, you know, some passionate people that really cared about not only MVP um, as an organization, but just people and just veterans and like not wanting to screw the story up, wanting to get it right. Um, so that was, you know, and that, I feel like that's clear in the film because it took me a long time to appreciate it and accept uh, that, that, that kind of uh, compliments like that, because, you know, I'm always so worried about screwing it up, you know, and telling our story wrong or like not doing it justice. And, because of the people involved that wouldn't let us fail. Uh, it did, you know, and I'm really proud of that. How this thing all started, um, as I kind of mentioned there, his name's Garrett Jones. He served in the, in the military in the UK, actually. But he served alongside a lot of uh, Americans, uh, largely Marines. He was in LA uh, visiting some of these guys, and he came to an MVP session. Um, and I'll get a little more into what MVP is later, uh, the organization, the charity. But came to a huddle and was just like, dude, this is, these are all the things I've been trying to say and all the things that I'm feeling that I haven't been able to, to get out, you know, and now I, I am, I am, I feel like my, I feel like my voice is heard and I feel like uh, everything I was trying to express, like this is, this is a place to do it. And when we're in a huddle and sitting in a room with other vets and athletes, they kind of feel the same way. And he's like, and I, I you know, I'm a novelist. I've written a few books and military memoirs. I think this is a movie. I think you've got to tell this story. And, you know, I'd love to help you write it if, if you something you want to work on. He, he knew I was working a little bit in film and TV. I'd been doing some acting, some hosting, and um, had uh, co-created and produced a few things. But, I've, you know, I'd never written or directed a, a scripted film or anything like that. So we started hashing it out. This guy is insane. His name's Garrett Jones, by the way. I'm sure he's going to listen to this. He's a big football fan. But he goes away for like three days and comes back with a first draft, of like a 120-page script. You know what I mean? Like unbelievable. Wow. Uh, and then we just we worked through it. Um, from there, we started sending it to people like Braden Aftergood, who would eventually become an executive producer on it. And he is producing partners with Sylvester Stallone. Um, and that's where we got the the Stallone stamp of approval and, and, and his name on the project. Um, and we sent it to other people, uh, Jordan Levin, who is a UT grad uh, and a good friend of mine, you know, that's worked you know, very high up at a lot of uh, big uh, studios and production companies and stuff like that. Um, and we sent it to uh, uh, Christian Gudegast, writer and director of Den of Thieves and um, many other projects who i had the good fortune of working on one of him, his films. So we had these like titans in the industry that were giving us script notes, you know, and we're just like these two guys trying to figure it out, but they just were moved by the story as well. And that just kind of kicked the ball, um, you know, down the field little by little. And uh, it was, it was a, you know, a, a good year 
plus of drafts and redrafts and notes and you know changes and for us to get it to a place that we thought we could start kind of pitching it and figuring that out and then COVID sort of kicked everything into high gear and we just I found out that the veterans homeless shelter that we shot at was about to close down and I was like we have to film there we have to film on location so we just have to do this now and so this thing with that that was we were planning on making for quite a bit more money <laughs> was made for next to nothing um back in uh, October of 2020 but we had to we had to make it happen we had to get it done and we did and, and uh, you know I'm, I'm proud that I'm, I'm very happy that we were able to, to make it happen um, so at what point in this at what point what point in this process Nate did you guys decide that it would be a good idea for you not to, not only playing one of the lead characters by the way, for anybody who hasn't heard uh, a basic summary of uh, what this movie is I'm gonna just rip it straight from uh, the Apple TV description right now. A recently retired NFL player develops a strong bond with a homeless veteran who suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder. You play that homeless veteran. So at what point was it decided that you should not only play the lead, but also direct this film? It came down to a money decision, mostly. Um, you know, honestly, from the directorial side, uh, Braden after good, and I had been talking about this for a long time. Like, Braden... He, he was a producer on Lone Survivor, um, Friday Night Lights. He, he worked with Peter Berg for a long time and then sort of went off on his own and eventually teamed up with Stallone uh, for Bal to, work to, to start Balboa Productions. And Braden was like, I think it's really important with this film that you have a lot of veterans involved at all levels, but it'd be really cool if you could find a veteran to direct this, right? Hmm. And I knew in my mind... At that point, when we had that conversation, you know, my thought process was one day, one day I'll, uh, you know, I'll be ready to direct a film, but I'm not ready yet. Like, I don't know, I don't know enough about this world. And I don't, I don't really know uh, if I could handle that kind of responsibility because it's your name on it. I mean, it's your project. It doesn't matter. Okay. I'm not gonna say it doesn't matter. It, it's like, it's like if you're the head coach, right? And the team has, a, you know, suffers a tough loss, a bad loss, whatever. All signs point back to you, no matter who made the mistakes out there. It, it, it comes back to you. And it's the same kind of um, responsibility, but also like you need to understand everything going on around set and whose role is what and what's important and all that. And I was still kind of learning that. So for me, when we first started talking about this project, I, I wasn't sure I could handle it. I wasn't sure I could do it. So I started interviewing some veterans and I met six, six different ones um, that were kind of younger in the industry like me. But they've made some stuff. They've already directed some, some you know, TV series, some shows, and some some films and music videos, various things like that. And they were all amazing. They really were, but they didn't quite have that same connection to MVP like I did. And after meeting them and kind of hearing about what their approach would be, it was pretty similar to to my approach in a lot of ways. And I just remember thinking. I, I can, maybe, maybe I can do this. Like maybe I should just believe in myself a little more and do it because one thing I know I'll be able to bring in is some of these, uh, some of the names we were able to bring in from the athlete side. Right. Um, and I know the vets will want to work on this thing. If I, and I, I know the language I need to speak to the, these MVP members to guide them. And so I just said, you know what, I'll direct it. First of all, I don't have to pay a director then <laughs> that saves us. Um, and then when it came down to shooting it, you know, I was always planning on playing a kind of a smaller role, right? Mm. Um, but once we were kind of knee deep in this idea of all these vets on screen being played by vets, and we were casting it as such, and I had it in my mind when we were writing it, and I'm getting ready to direct it, like who's going to play what role? Um, I just was like thinking, you know what, I, I. I can do this. I, I had just produced my first feature film in January that was made for a, also a very low budget. And in that film, the director was also the lead actor in it. And he had a good team behind him supporting him. And, you know, it was very challenging, but we got through it and figured it out. And so I was like, you know what? Like, that's one less person I have to pay, one less mouth I have to feed. <laughs> but also, like, I know I'm committed to this and I'm going to go all in on it. I'm just going to go for it. And I'm going to let when I'm on camera, I'm going to let these people with more experience than me coach me, right? And kind of direct me through that. Because I had another UT grad 
uh, Jared Hoffman I brought on as a producer mm-hmm. when we were shooting it. And Jared, you know, as well as Mo McRae, who plays Will Phillips, the, the other lead, yeah. they are behind the camera coaching me up. You know what I mean? And those guys are back there making sure we're getting what we need in the monitor, you know, uh, because I'm not ever able to be back there and, and, and watching it. And one thing that I pride myself on is collaboration and making sure that if I put strong people in positions of leadership, um, as much as I maybe want to fight it sometimes, I need to trust them. You know, I need to just trust them that we got it. And I had an amazing DP, very young guy. Um, turns out he was the only uh, department head who wasn't a veteran on this project, which was really cool. And, you know, it just, uh, it just came down to that. Like just these people have been there a lot more than you have, mate. So listen to them, you know? And I mean, it, it, it's challenging. It's, it's certainly like one of those situations where you're so passionate about the story and sometimes it blinds you a bit and you get in your own way because you're so afraid. Like I said earlier, letting people down or screwing it up and so you're fighting with yourself. You're you end up fighting with other people on set about how something should be portrayed or shot. And if something goes wrong, I just remember, and everything go, every day something goes wrong. And Murphy just that's what that's what a movie is. Mm-hmm. But I was I would you know I struggled with that, and I had fortunately a very patient, um, understanding, amazing team behind me, making sure that uh, we weren't going to fail. You know, not letting us fail. So it was. It was just, it was just one of those things that, that uh, I felt I could do it. I felt confident that I could put this, bring this thing to life and make it happen. But I knew I had to put the best possible team around me. And I was able to, even though I, you know, <laughs> at times I couldn't really pay him, <laughs> you know, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm just grateful that they stepped up and, and, and it really saved MVP because MVP as an organization is saving a lot of people's lives. And it was important to do this story justice and tell it right. Yeah, I would imagine for a lot of folks that it uh, comes down to much like w- what we hear in sports all the time, that it comes to, down to the the love of the project and uh, believing in the cause that it all stands for. And you and Mo McRae had a great rapport on screen, but there were moments where you're having to act on your own throughout this film as well. And, and you really dig down and you hit certain emotional chords that I'm sure for a lot of people, actors included, are very difficult. Was that easier for you to do based on your own experiences and i'm sure the countless conversations that you've had over the years with veterans who are struggling with their own mental health issues i don't know if it was easier probably not easier because i think i have a lot of respect for for the job of of an actor right um willing to be vulnerable and kind of put yourself out there Mm -hmm. um you know, it's challenging and, and, and it's, there's a reason it's a very competitive field and it's very hard um, to, to gain any traction in that world and to be successful because a lot of people want to do it. Um, but a lot of people aren't willing to put in the work that it takes and also kind of you know, rip that chest open and show, show who you are and what's going on because that's, it's challenging to do. And it's especially challenging in some ways, I think, for a lot of us veterans and, and probably athletes, you know, who pride ourselves in toughing it out, you know, and suck it up and drive on and all those things we talk about. And this is like the opposite of that when you have to just be willing to be vulnerable. Um, I don't know if it was definitely wasn't easier, but I understood it. I related to it so much. And, you know, all the words in the script and, and that, you, that you see on screen and hear on screen, those are more than us writing it. We transcribed it. You know, those are, like you said, those are the stories of, these people, these, those are things I've heard people say that line. Most of my post-traumatic stress is from lack of traumatic stress. A veteran told me that a very accomplished veteran who's done some pretty incredible things in, in the highest possible unit you can imagine. He told me that on Ventura Boulevard in LA, uh, we ran into each other and we were having a conversation and he said that. And I was like, it just sat with me, you know, just, I was like, man, that is powerful. And I totally get that. Like, I feel that. Um, and, uh, and so we, we put it in the film, you know, and like, that's how all the dialogue was written and all these stories and moments. It was all from those, uh, other people's stories and moments, you know, really, I mean, people that, what they've shared at MVP, what we, what I've heard other people, you know, say in the past and same with the athletes, these are all things that have been said. When you get to the scenes with 
with Tony Gonzalez and Randy Couture and Jay Glazer. Those people, those men, that's they've said those exact things at MVP in a session, in a huddle, right? Jared Bunch, the guy who plays Ray Jones, he was a first round draft pick for the New York Giants. Um, and is, you know, a very, he's a very good actor too. He's great. But that guy um, has been a member, you know, and a part of our team for a long time. And a lot of what he said, a lot of the story development with uh, the Will Phillips character, it's from people like Jared. It's from people like Tony Gonzalez, you know, and these guys that have told these stories. And then when they get there, you know, in the huddle on screen, they're just sharing what they've shared all along with us. And, you know, I remember Tony's scene specifically, it's written down in the script and it's pretty much what he had said in a session before what I wrote and we get there and I was like, all right, you got it all memorized. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got it. I'm ready. You know, I'm like, cool. Just tell your story. Don't worry about the script at all. It, I don't care if it takes you five minutes or whatever. Like just tell your story, how you, how you pulled it in here. You're talking to this group. Do, do not worry about the script. Just, just tell it. And he did. And it was perfect. You know what I mean? Like, I think we just did it twice. I think the first time I feel like the first time, he was like word for word on the script. And I was like, no, and it was still good. But I was like, Tony, I just want to see you. Dude, you are way more interesting than these words. So you just, you just tell that story. So he tells that story, you know, and I know you remember because you just saw it, like when he's talking about going out to Spain and people will see it and, and they'll get a yeah, chance that, to experience he, it too. He, That's he just really, a real story. He, re- yeah. he really went through that struggle as a, uh, in his post playing career. Wow. Exactly. I mean, this guy, you know, 17-year NFL, maybe the greatest all tight end of all time, Hall of Famer, first ballot, broadcasting career, whatever whatever he wants, you know, the handsome dude, you know what I mean? And still, <laughs> just like everybody, man, we all struggle. And he, he's the one who coined that, that phrase we use all the time, like that, I'll never be great again, that feeling of just like peaking, you know, and, he's, and he was in his late 30s. A lot of these guys, the vets and athletes alike, they're in their early twenties and it's over. You know what I mean? And like to feel like you peaked then is just so challenging to to move forward. And so that was just all that all that authenticity and just those real stories. That's what that's what made this thing work because it was just real. That's really cool to hear. And one of the themes throughout this movie, uh, something that's uh, said and verbatim in some cases, but uh, in a roundabout way in others, is that everybody's fucked up. Like. You may be really fucked up and respect to that, but everybody is fucked up. So to think that you're the only one going through problems, you're wrong about that. And it's why it's not only okay, but necessary to open up to other people so that you can really see that some of the struggles that others are going through, and maybe that will end up helping you in the long term. So my question for you based on that, Nate, because you're a pretty uh, stand-up dude, obviously, uh, somebody that Longhorn fans take a lot of pride in, in getting to call our own. How are you fucked up? That's a great question. I, I, uh, we all are. We're all a mess. You know, there's another line right before that. You know, everybody, you think you got the monopoly on pain, right? Yeah. Um, and that's a, and that's that's such a a real thing. And there's a lot of there's a lot of vets out there. I think that they get home. And they feel like not only is no one going to understand me, but no one feels this pain that I feel. There's no way they could, like after what I witnessed, what I experienced. Um, but pain is relative and and pain is pain. You know, everybody has it. Everybody has their issues. Everybody feels like an imposter at times. Everybody, um, everybody feels like they're not enough, you know, and they're not, they're not, they're not good enough and they're not worth it. And, um, they don't make a difference and they don't belong. Like we all have felt that, you know, that's why bullies bully because they don't feel like they belong. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so everybody feels that it doesn't matter, uh, what you've sort of been through. Uh, and, and that's super important. And that's like kind of the, that's, a, that's a big piece of why MVP, the organization works. So let me tell a little bit about yeah. MVP. So MVP stands for merging vets and players. What we do is we bring together combat vets and former professional athletes. We help them find purpose and identity when the uniform comes off. Um, We found back in 2015, after I'd been cut from the Seahawks, you know, uh, I I spent 10 years in the Army, five years at UT, and um, I got to, I got the, we had the honor and the privilege of, of serving in the Special Forces and being in that Longhorn locker room. 
And there were so many similarities with the camaraderie, with uh, the purpose, the structure, the mission, you know, being a part of a team, being shoulder to shoulder, quite literally, uh, you know, the men on your left and right next to you, like you gotta, you gotta uh, trust them. And, you know, the best teams are ones that are selfless, you know, and about the people around them. Like is war and playing football the same or even similar? No, not at all. Um, but the locker room is like so similar, you know, and the loss uh, of all those things when you lose the uniform, including that that feeling that you that identity of like this is who I am. You know, I am a I am a Green Beret. I am a Texas Longhorn or a Seattle Seahawk. Um, and like I'd gotten out of the military in February of 2015, and 2014 was my senior year at Texas. I had uh, in May I went to the Seahawks as an undrafted free agent, and I, I got to play in one preseason game, and then that next round of cuts, my number got pulled. And so that's September of 2015. Now I go from the last 10 years of my life having, you know, the camouflage, the burn orange, uh, the Seahawks jersey, and, like, these are who I am. That's why I feel like I am anyway. And now it's like I'm none of those things, and I'm 34 years old, and, yeah, I got to do some really cool stuff, and, yeah, I got a good story, and – whatever all that but it felt like it was over like my story's done you know and it's like man i might i might live another 50 years 60 if i'm real healthy like <laughs> i gotta figure this out you know what i mean um i can't this can't be the end this can't be my greatest moment i remember something mac brown he said i wasn't in that locker room because i didn't win a national championship but when he's in the locker room after they win the uh, the national championship in 06 you know with with, uh, with vy in the rose bowl he says, don't let, let, don't let this be the greatest moment of your life. You know what I mean? So don't let, don't let that be. And it's, and it's amazing. Cause it's like, that's what anybody would think, you know, you're where you're in that jersey, you're in that locker room. Um, after that moment, like that's, that's what everyone's going to remember you, remember you as, you know, I, I was just with Jonathan Scott last night. It's like, he's a member of that team. He's a, you know, that's a national champion. Like that's, Oh, that's Jonathan Scott. He won the national championship with Texas in 06. And it's like, that's who, you feel like you are, you know? Um, and, and I just was kind of struggling with figuring out what I was going to do next. I, I had a lot of ideas and dreams. I've always been a big dreamer, but I was like, man, I got to start all over, <laughs> you know, like I put all this time and energy into this and I knew it wasn't going to last forever, but it didn't matter because I was passionate about it. That's what I wanted to do. And now it's like, I wasn't really preparing for it to be today. And all of a sudden it's like, this is it, you know, it's today. And I'm done. And so, like, I, you know, I thought about going back in the military, and i would become good friends with Jay Glazer. And Jay, um, for those that don't know, is you know, the ultimate uh, uh, NFL insider, really. Uh, he works for Fox, and he's, he's – I mean, this guy has had uh, relationships, close friendships for 30 years uh, with players, coaches, GMs, you know. And so he sees – and for over those 30 years, he's seen these guys that come in the league, first round draft picks, the, basically the story of Will Phillips, our lead character here in the movie, you know, deal with injuries, um, be on bad teams, coaching changes, all these things happening, and just struggle with feeling like they were a bust and they didn't do enough and they could have been better. And, you know, and then they get they get cut and it's over and it's like, they just deal with this huge crisis of identity, not only identity, but just like, man, I'm a failure. You know, I just, I'm a, I'm a huge bust. I didn't make it. I let everybody down and I'm just going to go into hiding. And so many vets feel that same way too, you know, like this, whether it's what's from survivor's guilt or, you know, a litany of other things. And they're just like, well, I, 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 I just, uh, I'd rather separate um, from the guys that I started with. I'd rather just disconnect and kind of, go my own way and you know i'll figure it out i'll figure it out on my own you know i survived war i can survive this hmm. and it's not always true i mean when you look at veteran suicide rates and, and a lot of these athletes too um and at least the you know depression anxiety mental health issues all these things that a lot of these people seem to suffer with suffer suffer from um it, it's it's just it's this this the similarities are pretty compelling 
And um, there's also like on the good side of things, there's this mutual respect between vets and athletes. Like they understand how to sacrifice quite a bit to be elite, right? Um, you got to put, you got to pour a lot of time and energy into it. You have to be committed. Um, those that make it at the highest levels in, in sports aren't always the most athletic and the, and the most capable. They're the ones who worked the hardest and took care of themselves. And, you know, we're up at, up at that, in that 6 a.m. workout, they were in there early and taking care of their body and nutrition and all that thing. I mean, I think everybody understands that from the veteran side of things, but I think people often don't realize uh, that side of it from the athletes. But then also, the typical NFL career is three years, you know, if you even make it that far and you're cut. And it's like, you don't know what day that's coming. You're not prepared for that. It's a little different in the military. We almost have the advantage in that respect of like, I signed up for four years. I'm in for four years. I know this is the day that I get out. I can extend if I want. Um, but, but, you know, so that's a little bit different. We don't just get cut, right? Um, of course, if something happens, tragic. I mean, you're, 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 you're at war. So like it can end, of course, you know, that stuff happens. But it's just a little bit different uh, mindset and preparation. But both those both those groups, vets and athletes, like we we don't have a plan B because we feel like if we do, we're not going to put all our energy into plan A. And if we don't do that, we're not plan A is not going to work out. So we have to just we don't think about the future and think about what's going to happen when we lose the team in uniform. We, we don't we don't even like go there because it's just if I have that mindset that this could end, uh, it's going to. You know what I mean? It's I'm, I'm already. I'm already, it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. That's how we feel. So we don't even like, don't even consider that as an option. Uh, what, what's going to happen when it ends? It's just never going to end, you know? <laughs> That's just how I feel. So anyway, the, the organization came about from a need that I had um, and an understanding that a lot of vets and athletes were feeling this. And Jay, Jay recognized it even before I did because um, Jay Glazer is who I co-founded MVP with. And, uh, you know, now we've got eight chapters around the country and we just had an event tonight with the Dallas Cowboys and the movie's playing right now at the star, which is really cool. There's 300 people in there getting to watch it for the first time. And, you know, coach Quinn and coach McCarthy were there and they understand how valuable MVP is. And they, you know, they, they, they try to involve their players and former players as much as they can, as well as the vets. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's a cool deal. And, and MVP is about the genesis of, of merging vets and players. The movie is the movie's about how it all began. And people can go to vetsandplayers.org to find out more info. You can also become a member there as well. I'm sure you can uh, donate there too uh, because this is yep. such a good cause. Please do. <laughs> now, mate, I, I can't let you go without asking you uh, a little bit about Texas football because I know as busy as you are, you still try and find time to keep track of what's going on with the team. Oh, yeah. So, uh, how do you feel about uh, Coach Sark and company in the middle of year two? You know, there, there have been some moments this year that are a little bit disappointing, but overall – uh, got to feel oh, pretty man. good about how things stand heading into a big matchup with TCU this weekend. Yeah, I feel really good about it. I mean, we all know this and it is what it is, but I mean, we're sniffing at nine and oh, you know what I mean? Like we almost beat Alabama, um, with our number one, with QB one out, you know, for 85% of the game. And, um, and we still fought and Hudson card came in and did a, did a, did a great job, man, did everything he could. Uh, it just didn't go all way. I mean, that's Alabama. It's a great damn team. So that was uh, already impressive. I was in the stadium there, just the energy. That's the one game I got to go to this year. Mm. It was just awesome. I mean, I was hey, – it was amazing. It really did feel um, feel special to be there, even though we didn't we didn't finish. We're going to beat them in Tuscaloosa next year, by the way. <laughs> um, you know that as well as I do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and then obviously Tech was <laughs> – Playing it, playing out in Lubbock is tough, but that was a heartbreaking game. You know, being up like that and losing in overtime. Same thing happened with Okie State for the most part. Felt a lot like Tech. And we've had a couple other games that started to head that way, including last week, Kansas State, where it's like we're still learning to be a second-half team. But we're finishing some of these games, you know, and we're, we're winning. We're closing out and learning how to win. And that's huge. That's huge. So the growth is there. I mean, we've already won more games than last year, like I said. We are on, on the edge of being 9-0. and We can beat any team in the country, and we know that. And that's that's a good feeling because it hasn't felt like that um, in prior years, right? I mean, but I literally – there's not a team I don't think we go toe-to-toe -to -toe with and make a, make a game out of. I, I, I don't care who it is. You know what I mean? I, I truly believe that. Um, and 
people may say that in the past. Maybe I'd even say that, but I, I, I don't know if I fully believe that. Um, I absolutely believe that right now that we can beat anybody. And I hope the team believes that. They should believe that. Um, and I think they're going to beat TCU. I really do. I think TCU is a great team. They're always fast. They're always, um, you know, they score a lot of points and they got a tough D. Um, but at the end of the day, we know we've got the, we've got the most talented team on the field, like from an athletic standpoint, overall size wise and all that we, we do, you know, and we know that, um, well, we have and the, now we it's have just a matter of believing. We have, great, that, we have the great equalizer. His name is B. John Robinson. Okay. I, mean, I can't, man. he's, I'm, we're going to miss him when he's gone. Does he have one more year? Is he, is he stuck one more year with us? Te- technically he has one more year, but he's, he's going pro once the season is over with. Oh, but so this is his third year out of high school. So it's his third year out of high school. Yeah, so yeah. He, oh yeah. He's, he's gone. After this yeah, he gone. He gone. <laughs> I don't blame him. And he should, and he absolutely should. Um, but he's been, yeah, he's been, uh, he's been incredible for us, but I mean, on both sides of the ball this year, that's the, that's been another thing, both sides of the ball. Uh, we've been very, very good, very dominant in a lot of ways. I mean, that Oklahoma game, I know that was, wasn't their QB one either, but it was 49 to nothing. And it could have been a lot worse. Like it, it felt worse. I mean, we just absolutely dominated that game. Um, and, and that was, and that was pretty cool just to see that, you know, uh, especially after the tough one, you know, to Bama a couple weeks prior, it was like, this is man. All right. We are, <laughs> we're a good football team, you know, a really good football team. So, um, so that's great. I got a lot of high hopes. I mean, obviously we have some incredible recruits coming in as well. So the future looks bright. I'm excited to get over to the SEC and, and win there. And I think this is a good, I think that that momentum we're building out of here, you know, we need to, we definitely need to win a, a big 12 championship or two before we go over there um, and end that right. But, uh, but, you know, we're going into that. It's like feeling like feeling like we absolutely belong, which I already feel right now is good where it's like in the past, you know, maybe didn't quite feel that yet, even though, you know, every time we get a chance to play one of these teams over there, we seem to do all right, you know, including uh, sugar bowl a few years ago against Georgia. So um, I don't know. I've always been a, obviously a big believer in Texas, but, um, it's good to see the result, you know, and to see some of those W's start to stack up and excited about seeing how this season ends. Even if, even if TCU does get us, um, I, it's, you know, it's going to be a hell of a game and, uh, and we're, we're right where we need to be moving forward with the future. So I'm stoked. Yeah. To see this team playing meaningful football in November. I mean, ESPN college game day is literally going to be here this weekend. Uh, that is a uh, big step forward. All right, Nate, last question, because uh, even though this is airing for the first time tomorrow, November 9th, you and I are speaking on November 8th, which is Election Tuesday. You have always been a voice of reason in this crazy world with which we now live, where people have a hard time having conversations, even disagreeable, especially disagreeable conversations about things. Are you optimistic or pessimistic right now with the direction that this country is headed? I'm optimistic. Um and I'm not just saying that because I want to be optimistic because I also want to be optimistic, but I, I'm, I think that there's, there's a lot, a lot healthier conversations happening. Um, there's also still unhealthy conversations happening. Um, but I think we just see the void in leadership and, and recognize that we need strong, probably younger leaders um, at all levels. Uh, people that are relate a little bit more to this generation. Um, I would love to see more veterans have opportunities in those leadership roles, you know, even uh, at the highest levels. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, I'm not saying that veterans have all the answers or anything like that, but when you're talking about, um, you know, <laughs> global diplomacy and, uh, you know, it's just, especially now with all these, with a lot of the threats going on around the world, you know what I mean? And I think having somebody that's been there, boots on the ground, um, that sort of walked that walk, there's a lot of value in that. And I know we have those people uh, in in office, you know, at various levels, but, you know, I I just, I I hope that somebody will emerge um, or some, or more people will emerge, I should say, Um, with that background as we continue to move forward. And it shouldn't only be that because there's plenty of people um, on the civilian side of things that see, see things differently than we do on the military side and and offer a different perspective and a lot of value um, to that as well. So I want to see, 
I want to see those groups work together. I want to see that all kind of um, come together. And, and I mean, that's the hope uh, for me, but uh, I am optimistic. I think, you know, we're the type of place, America's the, the kind of country that things will backslide and, and, and start to collapse and, and, and fall apart in some ways. And we're, we're not quitters. We're not the type of place that we just will allow that to happen. We're going to, out of pure survival instincts, um, we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to have to force, be forced to come together and figure this stuff out um, as we move forward. And so I, I think that that's, I think that's what's going to happen. That's what I truly believe. Um, and I think honestly, that's part of the importance of the story of MVP. Um, and, and, and the film, like that's what it's about. It's about people from different backgrounds, different walks of life that on paper have nothing in common that come together because they do have a lot in common as well um, as far as like where they're hurting and what they're struggling with. And they need to lean on each other to figure this stuff out. And it kind of opens up their eyes to new perspectives in the new world. And I think that that needs to, that needs to happen nationwide, worldwide, um, everywhere. So. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm optimistic. Long story long, I'm optimistic. Well, if we could figure out a way to uh, to claim to clone you, then uh, I'll feel much better. No, you don't want that. In the direction this whole thing is heading in. He is, you definitely he, don't want that. He is Nate Boyer. The uh, the website, one more time, for MVPs, vetsandplayers.org. And the new movie, it is called MVP. It is out on demand. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you. It is an excellent film. I had tears in my eyes at the end. Nate's performance is incredible. As uh, we've talked about throughout, he directed, co-wrote it as well. It is uh, filled with vets who play vets in the film. You also have uh, quite a bit of star power as well. Everybody from Tony Gonzalez to uh, Michael Strahan, Rich Eisen makes an appearance near the end. It's just a great film, and I can't wait for uh, Longhorn fans and everybody else to get to check it out. Nate, thank you as always for the time, man, and congratulations on this. Appreciate it, Trey. Welcome. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for hanging out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.